Hello and welcome to Midweek Connection on September 29th, 2023 here at First Presbyterian Church. My name is Pastor Joel. And I'm Pastor Natalie. And we are going to do what we did not do last week, and that is actually do our uh, lectionary discussion reading. We've been busy, but that's okay because God meets us even in the midst of our busyness. So let me open us in a word of prayer and then we'll get into our texts today. And just a heads up on all of these texts, they're going to be interesting. So we'll go from there. Gracious Lord, thank you for this day and this time. Thank you for a chance to get back together and read your word. And I pray, Lord, that we would hear what you have for us to hear today and that we would respond faithfully to it. We thank you and praise you. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Starting today with Psalm 88. O Lord, God of my salvation, when at night I cry out in your presence, let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to Sheol. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like those who have no help, like those forsaken among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a thing of horror to them. I am shut in so that I cannot escape. My eye grows dim through sorrow. Every day I call on you, O Lord. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the shades rise up to praise you? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave, or your faithfulness in Abaddon? Are your wonders known in the darkness, or your saving help in the land of forgetfulness? But I, O Lord, cry out to you. In the morning my prayer comes before you. O Lord, why do you cast me off? Why do you hide your face from me, wretched and close to death from my youth up? I suffer your terrors, I am desperate. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dread assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. From all sides they close in on me. You have caused friend and neighbor to shun me. My companions are in darkness. Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him all his angels. Praise him all his hosts. Praise him sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds, which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind, fulfilling his command, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his faithful, for the people of Israel who were close to him. Praise the Lord. Our uh, Hebrew scripture reading comes from 2 Kings chapter 9, starting at verse 17 and running through 37. In Jezreel, the sentinel standing on the tower spied the company of Jehu arriving and said, I see a company. Joram said, Take a horseman, send him to meet them, and let him say, Is it peace? So the horseman went to meet him. He said, Thus says the king, Is it peace? Jehu responded, what have you to do with peace, fallen behind me? The sentinel reported, saying, The messenger reached them, but he is not coming back. Then he sent out a second horseman, who came to them and said, Thus says the king, Is it peace? Jehu answered, What have you to do with peace, fallen behind me? Again the sentinel reported, He reached them, but he is not coming back. It looks like the driving of Jehu, son of Nimshi, for he drives like a maniac. Joram said, Get ready. And they got his chariot ready. 
Then King Joram of Israel and King Ahaziah of Judah set out, each in his chariot, and went to meet Jehu. They met him at the property of Naboth the Jezreelite. When Joram saw Jehu, he said, Is it peace, Jehu? He answered, What peace can there be so long as the many whoredoms and sorceries of your mother Jezebel continue? And Joram reigned about and fled, saying to Ahaziah, Treason, Ahaziah! Jehu drew his bow with all his strength and shot Joram between the shoulders, so that the arrow pierced his heart, and he sank in his chariot. Jehu said to his aide, Bidkar, Lift him out and throw him on the plot of ground belonging to Naboth the Jezreelite. For remember, when you and I rode side by side behind his father Ahab, how the Lord uttered this oracle against him, for the blood of Naboth and for the blood of his children that I saw yesterday, says the Lord, I swear I will repay you on this very plot of ground. Now therefore lift him out and throw him on the plot of ground in accordance with the word of the Lord. When King Ahaziah of Judah saw this, he fled in the direction of Beth Hagan. Jehu pursued him, saying, Shoot him also. And they shot him in the chariot at the ascent of Gur, which is by Ibium. Then he fled to Megiddo and died there. His officers carried him in a chariot to Jerusalem and buried him in his tomb with his ancestors in the city of David. In the eleventh year of Joram, son of Ahab, Ahaziah began to reign over Judah. When Jehu came to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it. She painted her eyes and adorned her head and looked out of the window. As Jehu entered the gate, she said, Is it peace, Zimri, murderer of your master? He looked up to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? Two or three eunuchs looked out at him. He said, Throw her down. So they threw her down. Some of her blood splattered on the wall and on the horses, which trampled on her. Then he went in and ate and drank. He said, See to that cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. But when they went to bury her, they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. When they came back and told him, he said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant Elijah the Tishbite. In the territory of Jezreel, the dogs shall eat the flesh of Jezebel. The corpse of Jezebel shall be like dung on the field in the territory of Jezreel, so that no one can say, This is Jezebel. And from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 7, 7 9. and 9. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is well for a man not to touch a woman. But because of cases of sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except, except perhaps by agreement for a set time to devote yourselves to prayer and then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. This I say by way of concession, not of command. I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has a particular gift from God, one having one kind and another a different kind. To the unmarried and the widows I say that it is well for them to remain unmarried as I am, but if they are not practicing self-control, they should marry, for it is better to be merry it is better to marry than to be aflame with passion. And our gospel reading today is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 through 15. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way, Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, 
neither will your father forgive your trespasses. And back to our Psalms, Psalm 6. O oh Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O oh Lord, for I am languishing. O oh Lord, heal me, for my bones are shaking with terror. My soul also is struck with terror, while you, O oh Lord, how long? Turn, O oh Lord, save my life. Deliver me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death there is no remembrance of you. And Sheol, who can give you praise? I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eyes waste away because of grief. They grow weak because of all my foes. Depart from me, all you workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and struck with terror. They shall turn back and in a moment be put to shame. And our final psalm today is Psalm 20. The Lord answered you in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your victory and in the name of our God set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. No, now I know that the Lord will help his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with mighty victories by his right hand. Some take pride in chariots and some in horses, but our pride is in the name of the Lord our God. They will collapse and fall but we shall rise and stand upright. Give victory to the King, O Lord. Answer us when we call. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. They are doozies. <laughs> so uh, which one do you want to start with today, Natalie? Or Can we just talk about the Lord's Prayer? <laughs> maybe, maybe we should just talk about the Lord's Prayer. So if you have been keeping up with your daily lectionary texts, you will know that the stories that we've been reading from First and Second Kings along the lines of uh, Elijah the prophet and Elisha the prophet and then the different kings of uh, Judah in the south and Israel in the north, we know that they are often complicated and messy and bloody and full of palace intrigue and are... Uh, what we would call descriptive of what was going on back at that time and not uh, prescriptive of what we should be doing today. Okay, We're describing um, largely the disobedience of the various kings in their rebellion against God's authority and the complications that that caused uh, in the northern and southern kingdoms. And we know that some of the kings were better than others, but most of them were very bad. Some of them were very, very bad. Um, and so Ahab and his wife Jezebel, very, very bad. Jezebel's son, um, uh, the uh, Jehu, not Jehu, sorry. Uh, let's see. Ba -ba -bum. Joram. Yeah, anyway. So, uh, yeah, Joram in the north and, uh, and Ahaziah in the south. And Joram and Ahaziah had uh, made a pact with one another. And then Elisha had anointed Jehu to be king, and he sent him out. And um, what we see is a result of the continued disobedience, especially of the northern king. Um, and then with the southern king in his alliance with the northern king and all of the prophecies that God had said would come to pass did come to pass even as uh, brutal um, and as um, unsettling as they can be right? right one thing and this was not in our reading but one mm -hmm. thing I was thinking about in terms of like the character of God and how um, and how uh, Elijah had actually gone to Sidon and healed a widow there in Sidon and provided food and all of the stuff that God had said uh, would happen. 
with a Sidonian woman. And the weird thing is Jezebel was the daughter of the king of Sidon and came down and corrupted Ahab's heart or added to the corruption of Ahab's right. heart. Um, and so in our gospel reading in Matthew, when Jesus actually goes to Sidon and then heals there the, uh, the, the uh, son of the, or the daughter of the Sidonian woman, um, that, that all of these stories are in mind while Jesus is doing this thing. And so even in the really kind of complicated, uh, right. kind of gross, you know, throwing down, blood spatter, dogs eating, only the skull and all, all that stuff, yes. all of that would have been known by Jesus and his disciples and probably even by the people of Sidon. And so right. the fact that God's character demonstrated through Jesus, his son, to go and heal people who had been at historical enmity um, really just goes to show the character of God and how severe judgment is upon the unrepentant, right. but how the character of God is so much just turn back to me and be obedient to me and, and the blessings that will follow. So just keep that in mind when reading the Old Testament stuff. Um, right. It's it's more talking about the unrepentant heart of the humans um, and the consequences for that as opposed to the character of God being much more uh, gracious and merciful and kind and compassionate. Um, That's all that I was going to say. Perfect. <laughs> then we don't need to say anymore, right? Great. Uh, let's see. Should we talk about the First Corinthians passage? Just briefly, anyway. Right. So, um, if one goes and one of the things that I want to remind everybody of usually uh, is that the uh, the letter writing um, custom of the day was at the beginning of the letter to explain to your audience why you're writing the letter. And so right. if, if you're having difficulty understanding certain parts of Scripture, especially a, of a New Testament letter, mm -hmm. go back to the first chapter and look again at to what the reason for the letter is. And usually uh, the letter writing formula is there's an introduction of the author, there's an introduction of the recipient, mm -hmm. there's a prayer of, of grace and all these kind of things. And then the formula for the uh, purpose of the letter is usually, uh, well, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, first, chapter 1, verse 10, this whole, now I appeal to you, or now I want you to know, or I want you to be aware of, but this line, now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. And so if you take Paul's point, Paul's goal in writing this letter, it really helps keep everything else in context. Right. And so his goal is that the church would be unified, mm -hmm. same mind, same purpose. And so if you look at each of the different sections that follow, keeping that in mind, you know, if you look back at chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, he talks about sexual immorality being in the church, and in Corinth there was some uh, pretty terrible sexual immorality going on in the church, and the church didn't really seem to be doing anything about it. Right. And so Paul addresses that, but he addresses the fact that all of us have some element of brokenness within our own sexuality, so it's not like some people are better and some people are worse. We are all in need of uh, redemption, not just of our spirits, but of our bodies as well. So when it comes to chapter 7, he is writing to say, hey, um, this is kind of how marriage should be done. Right. And it's not like it's rocket science, but at the same time, it's um, if you want there to be unity in the church, there really needs to be appropriate boundaries uh, around marriage, um, but also within the marriage but unity within the marriage and unity respect within the marriage. within the marriage. And right. I think that verbiage can be a little off-putting. You know, your body is not your own. And, and in our culture, that's such a 
you know, really, yeah, that just, yeah, right, is. I can do whatever I want. Right. You know, my body, my choice. Um, <laughs> Which is not a terrible one. <laughs> I don't think, I don't guess you want. But, but the verbiage is yep. not such that we are used to hearing. And so it can be off-putting. But then when you look at it in that context, it is it is care and respect mm-hmm. for one another at the very base of what it is saying. That it is, it is. It is this care and respect between two people. And there is this intimate relationship that is found that is unique or should be unique to the marriage. And with that, um, it's just a it's just a, a commitment to one another and care for one another. Right. Um, but I think the verbiage puts us back on our heels just with what it's saying. Right. Well, I think uh, or the verbiage right. is being not what it's saying, right, but right. just the verbiage. Well, I think Paul is being back. pretty blunt, you know, yes. and it and it is interesting that we had this whole passage from Second Kings on Jezebel and what was, you know, when Jehu finally arrives, what does she do? She painted her eyes. Right. She started using the you know tricks and trades of a woman who had not been faithful herself, right. and and so you know she's trying to corrupt Jehu's uh, you know God acting through Jehu to bring the necessary judgment on disobedience. Right. Um, and if one jumps to Revelation, you know you you get Jezebel showing up again, and right. and so the imagery of sexual immorality. Um, is is a pretty poignant one, right. uh, and so again, Paul uses some pretty blunt language to basically say, "Hey, look, you know, sex is between a married man and a married woman, and it's for that purpose, you know. Right. It, and don't don't go looking for it outside of those appropriate boundaries, right? Um, because th- that will." allow for actually greater unity in the church. You don't want to have a breakdown of the marriage relationship, which would then lead to the breakdown of like everything else. Because we know, unfortunately, we know that it happens. You know, so many churches um, and families and and lives uh, are are regularly destroyed by people uh, behaving inappropriately outside of the intimate bounds of of marriage. Right. Right. so then if we go to the gospel passage, it, you know, that's the Lord's Prayer, right? Nice. That's it's a lot more fun to talk about, right? Because we're familiar with it. We like this. These, this is what we recite every Sunday in church, right? It's good. Um, but how does it start, you know? How do, right. you know, it's don't, don't heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles do. And, and how often, even in our own churches sometimes, can we say too much here we are talking a long time but you know sometimes you can sometimes you can say too much right and uh that gets in the way of of good prayer because god knows what we need right so what do we do i pray as we were taught to pray yeah yeah honor honor god um Ask for his will to be done. Uh, uh, provide, igno- for us. provide for us, but then acknowledging that he actually has provided for us. Mm-hmm. And then recognize that when relationships get broken or damaged, um, you know, as ours is with God, that's why Jesus came to mm-hmm. reconcile us with God. But as our own relationships can be wounded or damaged, how do we work towards reconciliation? Right. Right. It's um, you know verse fifteen is uh, is is pretty important and not one that we maybe I don't know maybe we should start including in our Lord's prayer on Sunday morning you know just someone concluding it with verses fourteen and fifteen you know but if you do not forgive others neither will your Father forgive your trespasses we don't need the Lord's prayer to become trite or mundane or just something we say. Right. Think about it. Think about the words that we're actually speaking right. and um, what it is that we are offering praise, recognizing that provision, recognizing our need right. for the repair and the broken and the reconciliation and the broken instead of just something we say. Because yeah. we can turn the Lord's Prayer into a Gentile prayer pretty easily. You can say it and not really mean it. Right. You can say it because you're ex- to say it, but 
your heart's not in it. Um, right. Or you can say it in the sense of, you know, put the coin in the slot, pull the handle, expect God to do something. Right. Uh, that's that's not understanding the the actual hallowedness of it, the holiness, the set apartness mm -hmm. of His name, and how He's invited us to pray um, to our Father in heaven as a father who actually listens. And mm -hmm. that really hits back to all of the Psalms. We don't have time to talk about all no, of the Psalms. I know, they were pretty extreme today too. They but. were a very <laughs> wide, I was like, you're this torment and terror and all of these things. Praise the Lord. Right. Psalm 148, uh, I'm like, okay, and just I, and right I know, into that. <laughs> I know we've done that that uh, that transition, that combination before, Psalm 88 and Psalm 148. And every time you've started with 148, I'm like, yeah, it's a little bit of whiplash. It's a little bit of whiplash. It is. It's a little bit of whiplash. Uh, Psalm 20, how it's interesting, how it refers to uh, the chariots. You know, some some take pride in chariots and some take pride in horses, but our pride is in the name of the Lord our God. And, you know, back to the second kings, they're all riding around on chariots. chariots. That guy drives like a maniac. You know, let's go out there and take him out. And he's like, shut up. And get Done. shot to the heart. And, Riding around, throw them out, and it's like, well, don't don't take pride in chariots. Right. You might end up thrown out on the side of the road. <laughs> like, oh goodness. Yeah. But right, pretty extreme today. Pretty extreme. Pretty extreme. Um, hmm. Yeah. But God meets us everywhere. He does. He meets us at the extremes of our life and every point in between. Right. He's not absent. In the difficult, right, in those, yeah, those songs of crying out, he's there. He's there. Sometimes maybe a little harder to see or to feel that presence, but he's there. Yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah. How about we close with the Lord's Prayer today? What do you think about that? read it from the Matthew yeah. together. Our Father, Father in, in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Your, your kingdom come, come your will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread and, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us and um, in the midst of difficult words we know that the character of God is such that he does love us and he does provide for us and he is with us um, through all of those things. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining. Take care. Bye-bye.